historically black colleges and universities in the United States are a source of great pride for African Americans. HBCUs have produced many of the American civil rights leaders, most notably the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who graduated from a Morehouse College. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois graduated from Fisk University. Reverend Jesse Jackson from North Carolina A&T, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and Atlanta Mayor Andrew Young graduated from Howard University. And uh, Congressman John Lewis graduated from Fisk University. But less is known about the immense contributions HBCUs had in modeling and developing leaders in the struggle for the independence of countries in Africa. Dr. Namdi Azikwe, who became Nigeria's first president in 1963, graduated from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Prime Minister of Ghana, the first black African country to gain political independence, also graduated from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Dr. Hastings Kamuzu Banda, Malawi's first president, graduated from Mehari Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, a diaspora initiative dubbed HBCU Africa Homecoming is in the process of creating satellite campuses of HBCU colleges in Africa. Kwabena Boateng leads the effort. The HBCU Africa Homecoming initiative is actually a one-stop platform endorsed by the African Union to facilitate educational and economic opportunity exchange between HBCUs, African institutions, and the African Union. Morgan State University, a public historically black research university in Baltimore, Maryland, is leading the way and will initiate a degree programs in Ghana this year. Dr. David Wilson, president of Morgan State, has played a crucial role in the launch of Ghana's first satellite campus with all nations a university. Many of us now are understanding this global opportunity that how do you take what has happened in the United States and move the sons and daughters of former slaves and create a viable black middle class, which is what HBCUs have done. And so how do we take that model and basically make it happen more in places on the continent that are interested in the same thing? The African University College of Communications has signed a partnership agreement with Morgan State University. The partnership also allows Morgan State University's bachelor's and master's programs in global journalism and communication, as well as entrepreneurship. Kojo Yanka is the founder and chairman of Africa University College of Communications. So we have a program of study abroad where Students from the diaspora come for a couple of weeks. They go through Africana studies. Uh, they join students in communication or in business to go around the country uh, to do joint reports. Ghana dubbed 2019 the year of return as the country welcomed over 1 million Africans in the diaspora to visit the country and discover their African roots. Ghanaian President Nana Akofor Ado launched the Year of Return campaign in Washington, D.C. in September 2018. So far, high profile visitors, including several African American celebrities, members of the U.S. Congress, and other notable personalities, have visited the country. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Joining us today are three distinguished guests. Malaina Montgomery, Assistant Director of Study Abroad Programs at Howard University. Kwabena Boateng, Founder and Co-President of the African Diaspora Nation and Chair of the HBCU Africa Homecoming Initiative. And by Skype from Nashville, Tennessee, we have Jewel Green Wynn, Chief Diversity Officer at Tennessee State University. I have to say that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You're most very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, Malina, 
You are at uh, Howard? Yes, I am, sir. Um, I'm the Assistant Director for Study Abroad at Howard University and the Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center. Mm -hmm. We're one of the only HBCUs to actually have an International Affairs Center. And so within our office, Study Abroad is one of the primary resources offered as well as fellowship programs for the State Department and USAID. And how long have you been in that business? I've been working now in the Bunch Center for the past five years, actually. Past five years? Mm -hmm. So what specific plans do you have for interacting with Africa? Well, it's, it's great to have this opportunity to discuss that. Um, there's a growing number of Howard University students who are interested in studying abroad in Africa for both short-term as well as long-term programs. And so we're looking to continue to build out the opportunities that they have available. So right now, we send several students to Ghana, um, to Senegal, to South Africa, and we're working to increase the number of African countries that we work with. And so just even at the end of this month, um, I'll be going to Kenya to see uh, a program there that could be an opportunity for Howard students. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, Kwabena? Well, uh, I attended an HBCU and I saw a disconnect within the large HBCU community. And which specific? I went HBCU? to Florida A&M University I in uh, Tallahassee, there. Florida, the I home have, of the Rutless. I have been there. <laughs> I had a friend actually who was teaching economics there. Okay. A Ugandan by the name uh, Professor Dr. Ezra Suruma. Mm -hmm. I see. And I remember when I was an undergraduate student in upstate New York. I actually got on a ground bus and rode up to Tallahassee. Hmm. I see. Very interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a small college town, an awesome place to get a, a great education. Yeah. Like Howard, of course, it has produced a lot of very important uh, people mm -hmm. that have really uh, provided the service. Yes. Uh, Mayor of Atlanta, Keisha mm -hmm. Lansbottom, uh, Andrew Gillum, uh, mm -hmm. who ran for governor of uh, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, entertainment, uh, common, uh, and a host of others. So, yes, great reputation. So, what about uh, this initiative of yours? Mm -hmm. Well, so when I came from Ghana to the United States for college, you know, soon after that, I realized that there was a gap, mm. right? And uh, enormous opportunity could be unleashed if an effort, a deliberate effort, was put in place to actually bridge this institution. So uh, the vision for this came about 20 years ago. Uh, but over the last two years, after having an amazing career experience working with Chevron Corporation mm -hmm. and getting onto the global circuit as an expert uh, I thought the timing was right. 400 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived in English America in 1619, right, which was uh, commemorated last year. Uh, the middle of the de international decade for people of African descent, uh, declared by the United <coughs> Nations. And the Ghanaian president standing up here in Washington, D.C. and declaring a year of return. Looking at all those things coming together, the time was now. Mm. So in that year, uh, we kicked off the initiative and the response has been amazing, particularly from uh, the leadership shown by Morgan State, mm. uh, the African University College of Communications. We've learned that when we set the stage and provide that convening platform, and make sure that we have people who believe in authentic connections, meaningful impact, and believe that their time is really a precious commodity. Mm -hmm. We bring them into the space, amazing things happen. It's very interesting that uh, the incumbent uh, Ghanaian president, uh, mm -hmm. Nana Akufo Addo, has something to do with this program. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, actually, I draw a lot of inspiration uh, from his leadership. You know, uh, being a president and being able to signal with your words, even if you don't have all the resources, mm -hmm. can really inspire people. And uh, I draw inspiration from many sources, right, uh, from the Nkrumahs, but he, within the, this modern context, has been exemplary in uh, helping to energize this, this movements like this. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, uh, Joel Greenwin? <laughs> well, Tennessee State University actually 
um, started our international affairs office. I was the founding executive director for the office back in 2012. Our study abroad initiatives were siloed. They were in academic departments. And um, at that time, when I was thinking about how we could bring internationalization to the center of the campus, um, it became a reality for the president that we could really make this happen and make a difference for our students of color. Mm -hmm. um, we, we started with a very small staff and we've expanded. We've expanded the number of international students. When we first started, we only had 69 international students in 2012. And then by 2016, we had 851. So there was a lot of intentionality by the administration to ensure that Tennessee State University was committed to comprehensive internationalization. And of course, study abroad is one of the pillars mm -hmm. of comprehensive internationalization. So again, a lot of effort was put into reaching out to the various countries on the continent to find ways to have experiences, reciprocal experiences, whether we go there uh, and, and also invite the students to our campus. But it has been, it has not been without its share of challenges. But it has been a remarkable journey, remarkable journey. And we're so excited about what uh, Quabina has done with this 400 years of return, the year of return, and getting our students excited about traveling to the continent and learning more about their culture and who they are. Mm -hmm. We have quite a few uh, students from various countries on the continent. Uh, Nigeria is our largest population of students on campus. And we also have an African Student Association, which helps a lot in, in keeping those students engaged with the um, domestic students on campus. But it has been just a wonderful experience since we started the office. And we know we have a lot of work to do, especially as it relates to the continent, and we're just looking forward to opportunities like this that can help us to bridge the divide that exists between our, our well, our continents, actually, because there is a huge divide that still exists. And uh, what triggered that? What triggered the divide or what triggered the your interest, energy? Your interest in uh, the program with Africa. Well, I'm an African American, and I realized that because of the generation that I was raised in, I wasn't necessarily told the truth about my history. A lot of things that I found out since starting, unfortunately, the Office of <clears throat> International Affairs, I didn't even know. My parents didn't tell me. Maybe they didn't know. But um, we were just not given the truth about who we were as a people. And the first time I traveled to the continent and engaged in one of the elders there, it was uh, tear jerking for me. I just teared up and started crying when the young lady grabbed my hand and said, welcome home, my daughter. It, mm. it literally felt like something was going through my body. I never experienced anything like that. We have allowed the media to just mess us up in a lot of ways, negatively, as it relates to the continent and the same thing we're hearing from our African students, that they're being told a lot of things that are not true about American students. So as a chief diversity officer, of course, it is one of my roles to help with culture competency and to help the various cultures to understand and appreciate one another. But again, when I find, when I begin to personally find out, find out more about the continent and what we have been told that was untrue, it made me do more research and tell my president that we've got to do better by our children. I mean, I know they don't like to be called children, but we have to do better by our young people because they have been denied the truth about who they are. They've been denied the truth about what the continent really should mean to them. And so a lot of the study abroad experiences back when I started were to Europe or to China or somewhere in Asia. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait, wait, why are we going all these places? This is one of the reasons why our students are so, I don't like to use the word ignorant, but they're, they, they lack the knowledge that they need about who they are and where they come from. So we developed a program called Heritage Programming, and I know I'll have time to get into that a little later, but it definitely sparked my interest. I shared it with my team. 
we all agreed. I had all of them start to do research on various aspects of what the African students had shared with us and then some of the things that I wanted to see on the continent and things just it was like a domino effect. It was one thing after another after another. We started doing um, free DNA testing for our students to allow them to find out where their roots were. And then we tell them, well, why don't you think about going home? Why, why don't you think about going home instead of going somewhere that you have no physical, emotional, or social connection to? And again, it has <clears throat> it's just been um, just a remarkable experience for our students, but we have a lot more to do. And this opportunity that Quabina is bringing to us, I think will only enhance what we've already started. And we're just excited about it. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Malaina, I know that uh, there have been uh, so many African students over the years who have called Howard University home. Absolutely. Benefited enormously from that type of experience. Absolutely. What about uh, the Howard University students themselves, mm. what attracts them to study and live in Africa? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. And for different students, there are different reasons for wanting to connect to Africa and overall the African diaspora. Uh, I think that because, as Dr. Wade mentioned, our universities have African student associations, Caribbean student associations, there's a large population of Nigerian students, Ghanaian students on our campuses. When studying among peers from across the diaspora, they become interested in wanting to learn about those places of origin, uh, especially because there's a lot of great food in DC as well from mm. Africa. <laughs> the students are, are wanting to taste the real thing, so to speak, you know, directly from the source. You can go to, uh, you know, to Swahili village, for example, Ex for Nyamachoma. Exactly. <laughs> and Apio's down the street from Howard, mm -hmm. and so that's one really great uh, inlet into the culture. But as well as the curriculum, you know, at HBCUs we have a very rich concentration um, on black history, black culture across, across um, countries and across cultures. And so we have some great faculty members who incite the curiosity of students and there's great texts that they're reading and they want to connect the content of their, their classroom instruction with the actual lived experience of people across the continent. Um, and so those are, those are a couple of ways and reasons why. Um, I'd also just say that the faculty themselves, they mm -hmm. make up people from across the diaspora, across the continent. I remember myself as a Howard student having a, a faculty member who taught math from Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And just in speaking with him and hearing his accent and getting to know, you know, bits and pieces of his history or, you know, culture, that developed in me a great interest in, in going to Madagascar. I still haven't been there yet. In fact, now that you say it, uh, you somewhat look like uh, someone, if they found you walking in the streets of uh, Antananarivo, the capital, mm. they wouldn't tell that uh, you're from America. They probably thought that you actually belonged. And that is also a very strong reason why Howard students, I would argue most black students, are interested in going to Africa. They want to go to a location to study where they don't stick out, where they can find folks that are looking just like them and learning simultaneously the language, the culture, the history in a way where they don't feel so othered as they might within a different context. And talking about, uh, talking about faculty, for example, mm. uh, you used to have a professor, Ted Roberts, mm. who used to teach uh, journalism, mm -hmm. broadcasting, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. We used to work together here at the Voice of America for very, many, many years. Wow. You also have someone that uh, is very notable, a notable filmmaker, mm -hmm. uh, Haire Gerima, mm -hmm. yes. who also used to have you know, a bookstore nearby the campus. He still does. Yes, he still does. It's still a very popular place for Howard, the whole Howard community, to go and have lunch or to read books, uh, Sankofa. Sankofa, Sankofa, of course. Yes. Bush Mama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> and Harvest. And Harvest, right. And Harvest. Yeah. Now, Wabina, mm -hmm. it is interesting that uh, the Ghanaian president mm -hmm. uh, is very deeply involved in what we are talking about. 
Yeah, I mean, I consider him an inspirational mm. figure. I mean, he's not directly, he doesn't even know me in person, to be honest with you, right? But it is that power of leadership and inspiration that we draw, you know, and many of us uh, Ghanaians in the United States are drawing a lot of inspiration. I've seen people working harder than ever to promote Ghana. Because of his leadership. That's right. Mm -hmm. But of course, but, but f frankly, why not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, mm -hmm. the Ghanaian founding president mm -hmm. of the Republic of Ghana, mm -hmm. which used to be the Gold Coast, That's mm -hmm. right. was a man called Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. That's right. A man mm -hmm. who obviously uh, is a notable alumni of Lincoln mm -hmm. University mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. A man called uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois mm -hmm. That's right. was a very, very close ally of his. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he is buried in Accra. That's mm -hmm. right. There is a center for him. I've been there. Mm -hmm. I see. And even his wife is um. buried next to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did it wow. take this long? Hmm. Why did it take this long? Hmm. Uh, it is... Ghana <laughs> got independence in 1957. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's, it's taken a while. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been building up, right? But things have reached a crescendo mm -hmm. uh, right now. Uh, the African Union declared the diaspora the sixth region. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador Rikana Shihombo Rikwao, who was one of the endorsers of this initiative to kick it off, an instrumental figure whose uh, speeches have also helped to energize mm. right, various constituencies. Mm. Uh, the uh, involvement of celebrities like uh, Boris Kujo, mm. right, uh, the Full Circle Festival, uh, individuals like Diallo Sumbri, <laughs> these people have a sense of a calling. Bozoma St. John, right? Mm. People feel they call to be bridge builders in a time like this. As I said, in the middle of the UN decade for people of African descent, 400 years since the first enslaved, it's like a number of things are coming together. Mm -hmm. Some may say divine providence, but <laughs> definitely uh, there is an army of people who are rising up to be these bridge builders who want to bend the, the, the curve of progress, to bend the curve of human development in a way which aligns with the sustainable development goals. So this, this transcends tourism. Mm -hmm. This is about cultural exchange. This is about identity reignition. It is yes. about mobilizing as a people for development. And when you add in the fact that now you have the coming of an African continental free trade area, mm -hmm. which now allows you to access many markets mm -hmm. and it's going to be headquartered in Ghana, mm -hmm. right? All the pieces are coming into place and uh, we feel uh, it's time to accelerate. As to what is driving that, uh, many people have their own stories, but there are individual stories of how these people are responding to this call to really? be a performing generation of leaders uh, who do this work. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, uh, Joel? Uh, why are students at your university uh, interested in uh, going to study in Africa and living there? And living Tennessee State or living? Living in Africa and studying there. Well, there's a... I think there's mixed feelings about why. Um, when they come in for study abroad advising, uh, the advisors in my office, just the, one of the first questions that they ask them is, why do you want to go study abroad? And then the next question is, well, where do you want to go study abroad? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they say they don't know. And so we kind of guide them through what that means. And um, 
to even go study abroad because again, being at an HBCU, a lot of the students are first generation students. There are things that hinder them from even thinking about going to study abroad. So it's a process. It's not something very natural or organic for them, mm. uh, for the majority of them. It takes coaching and mentoring and guiding and directing them through what that looks like. Because a lot of them are like, oh, I could never go study abroad. I can't afford to go study abroad. And to think to go somewhere as far as the continent is just beyond their belief. But when they realize that this is somewhere that they can go, the level of excitement that you see in their eyes and when they talk to their parents and their parents call us and say, really, my child is going to be able to go to Ghana. My child mm -hmm. is going to be able to go to Nigeria. It's just it just makes us feel like we've done the right thing by helping them to understand that you can do this. Um, our universities here in Nashville, and I'm sure at other places, um, the students can use financial aid. Mm -hmm. So they can use their Pell Grant if they're Pell eligible. They can use their Pell uh, money, their mm -hmm. refunds, to help fund the study abroad. The good thing about the study abroad experience, the good thing about TSU is that we have an international education fee. Every student pays $10 per semester. Mm -hmm. And it goes into a fee called the international education fee. So this develops into a pool of money that we're able to give students scholarships mm. to actually go study abroad. This gives us um, leverage as we're building programs and we are finding partners uh, on the continent that are willing to kind of meet us halfway with uh, resources, whereas, you know, they may uh, provide housing for the students and things like that. So there are a lot of things that we have to get past before the students actually realize, you know, they have this aha moment that, wow, I'm really going to go study abroad. So we have to get through a lot of things first. So I don't I don't think I have a one best answer for why do the students want to, but once they feel like they can go study abroad, the curiosity is just beyond what we could ever imagine because a lot of them have never been outside of their neighborhoods. They haven't been outside of Nashville. They've never been on a plane. So, um, it, it takes a lot to prepare them for the journey to the continent, but once they get there, it's like they just can't believe it. A lot of them do talk about wanting to live on the continent or wanting to bring their siblings or their family back just so they can have that experience. It is a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and I tell everybody it needs to be on your bucket list. My friends, if you have not been to the continent, I don't care where you go. Go to the continent. You must go. And since I've experienced Ghana, it's like, oh, my goodness, you've got to go to Ghana. <laughs> so it's, it's, it just kind of all depends on how the study abroad advisor right. sells the experience to the students. But walking them through those steps of getting their minds wrapped around, I can actually do this, then we can talk about why do you really want to go to Africa or, you know, one of the countries in Africa. When you went to Ghana, you obviously went to the Cape Coast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I did not go all the way to the Cape Coast. I did not. I, um, I've forgotten the name already of the places that Kwabina took us. I, w I didn't get Accra? to stay the whole 10 days. Uh -huh, Accra. Accra. Mm -hmm. we went yes. to, we went the hydroelectric. Place. The hydroelectric. That's right. We yeah. went to a yeah. place, a city which was built totally with the initiative of Kwame Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. So Kwame Nkrumah built Akusumbu. The hydroelectric plant. The hydroelectric power. plant. So yes. we decided to start this initiative, an HBC Africa Homecoming initiative, right. in a symbolic location. Mm -hmm. But why wouldn't you really take them to Cape Coast so that they, could, days, they could experience sincerely you know, some of what their ancestors really She's coming had to back go this year. We only had three days. School was about to reopen, mm -hmm. and there wasn't enough time to pack into that. But we're doing that this year. Uh, before, some can come before, mm. others can stay longer, right? It all depends on their schedule, really. Well, unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. Mm -hmm. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. Yo, check it out, man. This is Queen of Paso alongside Nigeria. We're the band with your real Mr. Sopiano. 
We appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can watch our show there and tell us what you think. Now let's look at what will be discussed next week. On the next Straight Talk Africa, each year 180 countries are ranked based on corruption in their public sector. Sub-Saharan African nations continue to struggle with their anti-corruption efforts. Corruption on the continent on the next Straight Talk Africa. And today we are talking about black colleges and universities in the United States expanding in Africa. Our guests are Malaina Montgomery, Assistant Director of Study Abroad Programs at Howard University, Kwabena Boateng, Chair of the HBCU Africa Homecoming Initiative, and by Skype from Nashville, Tennessee, we have Joel Green Wynn, the Chief Diversity Officer of Tennessee State University. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have to say again that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. An absolute honor to be in your presence, Shaka. I mean, you've been an inspiring figure. Uh, and uh, at a time like this, I think you really embody mm. uh, what the voice of America uh, is about fairness, objectivity, mm. and you provide inspiration to so many people on the continent. We are honored to be here, to have this opportunity uh, to interact with you, a man who, t to me, are uh, unlimited in your mind and work without boundaries. Uh, uh, I appreciate you. Profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled for both your compliments and support, sir. Thank you for your esteem. You're most welcome. Let me come to you again, uh, <laughs> my sister. Um, what are some of the most uh, popular destinations, for example, mm. for the Harvard students when they want to go to Africa? Sure, sure. And why? Well, when a student would like to go for a full semester, um, right now the most popular location is South Africa. South Africa. Mm -hmm. South Africa, followed by Ghana. Uh -huh. And when students are interested in learning the language, which we promote heavily in mm -hmm. the advising process, mm -hmm. and actually at Howard we have the Foreign Language Area Studies Grant, which allows um, students to take funds and actually study uh, African languages. Mm. So the students who study over the summer, Swahili or Yoruba, they will go to Nigeria mm -hmm. or Tanzania Kenya. with faculty members. Mm -hmm. um, Tanzania the, is and also... And those who study Zuru will go to South Africa? Yes, yes. Um, there are about, I think, five to ten grants that are awarded each year. Mm. And those are specifically for students who are interested in studying the language. Mm -hmm. But the great thing about studying in Africa mm. is that students can study all disciplines, no matter what they're focused on what their major is, what their professional aspirations are. They can learn political science throughout the continent. Um, they can focus on sustainability or issues related to peace and conflict. Um, and so we partner with different organizations who, who have programming that focuses on a critical issue in each of their locations that they're at. So in Uganda, um, no, so there's... They have not been to Uganda? 
Mm, there's a couple of students who have been, but not quite a lot. I'm a bit disappointed not... because uh, that's that is what I call home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll show them this program. Even though I, I think that um, I have transcended that because for me now home, in mm. fact, is Africa. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Africa with neither borders mm -hmm. nor boundaries. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's something we encourage the students to begin to wrap their mind around is, one, there's different parts of the country or the mm. continent that creates a different feeling or has a different culture or a different way of being. But the more they're interested in traveling once, mm. They'll continue to travel frequently, and then, as you've mentioned, think of the entire continent as a yes. place that they can call home. Yes. It just exactly. takes that first time of going and overcoming the stereotypes, overcoming the misconceptions, yes. overcoming the, the distance. You know, there's the fear of just being so far away from what they're familiar with here or their families. Yes. But once they've done it, mm. You can't stop them thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons that uh, I was attracted and uh, respected enormously some African founding fathers, uh, such as uh, the Ghanaian founding president, the Wasajifo, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, people like uh, Seko Ture of Guinea, mm -hmm. people like uh, Dr. Kenneth David Kaunda mm -hmm. of Zambia. Uh, these were people, including, of course, uh, Tanzanian founding president, Mwarimu uh, Julius uh, Kambaragi Nyerere. These were people who clearly, mm -hmm. for them, there were no borders, no boundaries. It was Africa. Mm -hmm. It was Africa. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, let me ask you uh, this, question, this question again, uh, uh, Malaina. Do, how are the university students, when they think about South Africa, mm. beyond Mandela, who obviously is an international icon, mm -hmm. beyond Miriam Makeba, mm -hmm. beyond Hugh Masekera, you know, those types of people, do they know or are they reminded that at one time, there was this thing called apartheid in South Africa, which was very closely linked mm -hmm. with something called Jim Crow Absolutely. here in the United right. States. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why they choose to really? go to South Africa. Yes. To understand how that country is moving past their history mm -hmm. in a similar way that we're moving through our history in the U.S., mm -hmm. but um, just the idea that African people in South Africa make up the majority and so wanting to see what it looks like where the majority of people from Africa are, are there trying to move past such a history that has taken so much from them mm. and I think maybe even learning um, what they've seen and you know, roads must fall in the movements that are taking places on campus that are influencing um, the academic spaces. Mm -hmm. I think Howard students are interested in, in understanding just a, another type of segregation and then how, how we are moving forward just as people and then having those conversations about how we're moving forward in the U.S. with black South Africans who are working to move forward, or even Africa and South Africans who are, who are working to move forward um, after apartheid. It is very interesting. You know that uh, uh, you had uh, a great man by the name, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., mm -hmm. uh, who said so many important quotable things. Mm -hmm. And I remember where he talked about how we must learn how to live together as brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. or we perish, we mm -hmm. all perish mm -hmm. as fools. Yeah. Absolutely. And I would say that the university environment is the perfect starting point for a lot of people to begin to move forward and think 
of someone who's different from them mm -hmm. as a brother or mm -hmm. as, as a sister. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time that they're outside of their mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. their families, mm -hmm. um, outside of the cultures that they've grown up in that may have influenced their thinking. And now they're finally right. at a place where they're able to draw conclusions based on new information that's learned firsthand by interacting with the others. And that being different is not necessarily either inferior mm -hmm. or superior. Absolutely that. Right. Absolutely it that. It is simply human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that you, are, you, you have the opportunity to complement and supplement one another. Exactly. Excellent. Very interesting. Exactly. Kwabena, mm -hmm. this initiative of yours, uh, how are students going to pay? How are students going to pay? Right, <laughs> so we connect with stakeholders like mm -hmm. Mariana. Mm -hmm. We're not working in isolation. Mm -hmm. We are a convening platform. We are a system integrator. Mm -hmm. We are a programmer, right? Mm -hmm. So we connect with people like Mariana, like mm -hmm. Jewel, mm -hmm. and the network across historically black colleges and universities. And then we say, okay, we have a program of action, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the talk of even building or having physical spaces mm -hmm. which cater to HBCU students from here and Africans, that's what these, uh, the idea of satellite campuses are. When you talk about um, satellite campuses, mm -hmm. in a lay person's language, mm -hmm. what exactly do you mean? It's an incubating space for collaboration which makes provision for students from here, students from Africa, and where short courses, uh, some short courses can be run in areas of need, whether cybersecurity, fintech, healthcare, and the like, agribusiness and all that, mm -hmm. and also where initially degree programs can be run. So a place which evolves into a full-fledged institution, mm -hmm. which has diverse components. Students from here, say like 30% from the US, students from Africa, another like 30%. Mm -hmm. A melting pot, which is really the vision that another HBCU titan, which we have forgotten to mention today, Dr. James Iman Kujiagri, mm -hmm. oh, who was, was the man. inspiration behind Kwame Nkrumah and Namdi Azikiwe and all that, and who was one of the founding uh, partners of Achimota School, which I attended. <laughs> we used to call him, you know, Agri of Achimota. That's right. When I was in junior right. high school. So I was in Agri, uh, I was in the Agri House of Residence, and actually uh, I'm disappointed in myself that it's taken me this long to acknowledge James Iman Kredu Agri, who visualized educators as people who help to unveil the identity mm. of uh, eagles who think they're chicken, mm. <laughs> right? Oh. So, so the, the whole idea is uh, we all start as eagles who do not fly, right? Mm. Uh, mm. Society conditions some people, whether it was Jim Crow, whether it was apartheid, to think that you are less, <laughs> right? So the HBCUs coming into the picture and helping to reorient mm. that paradigm, mm. right? Mm. It is like a naturalizer coming into the picture and say, hey, you this man, mm. you this boy, mm. you this girl, mm. you this woman, who have been made to think that you are a chicken, in fact, you are an eagle. And we will do all that we can within a nurturing framework mm -hmm. to help unleash that eagle within you. That is powerful. And that is the true essence of the HBCU spirit. Kwabena, you know there is a saying that um, it takes two, not one, to tango. Absolutely. <laughs> what about uh, the universities back in Africa? Mm -hmm. How do they feel with regards to this type of relationship? Well, with programs like this, with extensive reach across Africa, See, a lot of them had forgotten about this connection, particularly between HBCUs. The, le the letters HBCU, they mm -hmm. may know of individual institutions, mm -hmm. but as a collective. So what we do with these convening platforms is we have sessions on the history of HBCUs and Africa. Mm -hmm. So there's this work of orienting, this work of reminding, this work of capacity building, 
when it comes to building successful transatlantic educational partnerships. Yeah. And uh, you, you, last year, we had people like uh, Professor Soa of Dominion University College, a great patron of this initiative, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the Marehne of Ashanti, mm -hmm. uh, who we saw in the video and strong advocates of this saying, wow, we almost hurt ourselves by forgetting this, right? So there's that awakening to that realization. Mm -hmm. There's that reaching out to people like myself, that, hey, can you connect us to these institutions, right? So that's exactly what we're looking for. We want to remind, we want to uh, orient, and we want to be a gateway to facilitate these authentic connections, meaningful relationships, which don't waste people's time and deliver impact. Very interesting. Uh, um, Jewel, are you there? I'm here. I uh, gather that uh, one of your uh, most notable students perhaps uh, happens to be um, a one and only Oprah Winfrey. Is that correct? <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> To, the, to what extent have you been able to involve the one and only in this type of relationship? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that he really does have large or deep pockets and also a very deep heart. Right. We have not reached out to um, Oprah Winfrey for anything relative to this. As you know, when you are a billionaire, everybody is asking you for money for something. I am so um, happy that she has planted a seed there in Africa with the school that she has for girls. And I think in that's South probably Africa. where, yeah, where, where she has, you know, the most energy right now on the continent. Mm -hmm. But that is not something that my office thinks about as far as reaching out to her. What we do try to do is something similar to what Kwabina did, is to find any of our alumni who may be living on the continent and help them, ask them to help us connect uh, with universities and other individuals who may be interested in being partners with us because the strength of my office has been through partnerships and collaborations. There's no way that we would have been able to do all the things that we've done with study abroad experiences if it had not been for those partnerships and collaborations. But no, Oprah has not been contacted about anything like this. Um, we are very limited at HBCs as to who we can actually contact because the development office, of course, has priority mm. with asking for resources to support the university and various initiatives. Um, so we'll just see. We, we never know who may be living on the continent now that's a TSU alum who would be willing to help us find funding to get more students there. And again, to bring students from the continent here. We do want this to be a reciprocal relationship. We will be happy to ask Oprah for everybody. <laughs> In fact, talking about uh, being happy to ask Oprah, if for one reason or the other, Oprah was watching this program, mm -hmm. What would you say to her? Mm. If you want to say something, you could look in the camera mm -hmm. and talk to her. I'll say, uh, Oprah, we are inspired by what you embody. You embody uh, charity. You embody love. You embody excellence with caring. And I believe that the greatest gift we can give to someone is the gift of uh, them knowing who they are, their identity. And this yes. study abroad experiences are that uh, transformational for these students. So we encourage you to partner the HBC Africa Homecoming Initiative so that we can expand these opportunities for these students. And not only that, but actually build infrastructure which will accommodate the growing numbers who are interested in these experiences. And all you have to do to contact us is to go to uh, www.organizingforafrica.today. www.organizingforafrica.today. Not yesterday, <laughs> not tomorrow, <laughs> but today. And uh, we today. will be happy to contact today. Today. <laughs> Do you agree with that type of message, uh, Joel, as uh, someone that uh, 
uh, share, some, share something with opera, given your vantage point? I, I, I agree with what he says 100%, and I would say from alum to alum, I did my, my doctoral work there, but I didn't go to undergrad there, but from alum to alum, I would love to be able to have her a part of this initiative. She is just the epitome of success for us, for our young women, for our young men, just for everyone. And we're just so happy and honored to be able to say that she is an alum of Tennessee State University. So I would agree with everything Quabina said, but I would, you know, lean on that fellow alum uh, relationship and say, please consider assisting not only Tennessee State University, but any of the other HBCUs who are willing and, and able to expand um, this initiative. We hope, and I was talking to Corbina, I would love to see all 103 HBCUs eventually be a part of this initiative, mm -hmm. but it's going to take work. Mm -hmm. And the platform that you have provided, Shaka, is just, it's just amazing. So this is the start. Very interesting, very interesting. Now, Malina, mm. uh, what are some of the uh, hurdles that you have encountered? I call them hurdles because I used to be a hurdler myself. Okay. <laughs> I don't call them obstacles because uh, mm -hmm. when you call them hurdles, you have the possibility of jumping over the hurdles. Absolutely. I, I like that wording. <laughs> I like that a lot. That's a very positive mindset. Because I always believe in a, a glass being half full That's right. rather than half That's empty. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the hurdles that students may face mm -hmm. when considering whether to, to go to Africa um, or whether to study abroad generally. Hmm. Oftentimes, finances are stated as the number one mm. issue mm. Um, mm. that keeps students from approaching study abroad. And I half agree with that. Partly, I believe that without the correct information, they count themselves out of the opportunity before even coming in to find out the correct information. Mm. So that is one barrier for that reason. However, as Dr. Wade mentioned, there are several schools that use, that are allowing students to use their financial aid to study abroad. So, right. for example, at Howard, even our institutional aid can be used to go on a full semester abroad. Mm. And so that's something that is at a cost to the institution, but the experience is so important for Howard students that our president, Wayne Frederick, has made that commitment and continues to make that commitment each semester. Um, so for those students, finances are not the obstacle. I think oftentimes it's a general lack of confidence in doing something that feels to be a tremendous leap of faith mm. uh, or to require a leap of faith. and. Again, with all of the misconceptions and misinformation that's out there about what it would be like to go to Ghana, what it would be like to go to South Africa or Ethiopia, um, students oftentimes take a more commonly sought out uh, location just simply because it's easier and mm -hmm. they know that there's five other students that are in their class who have gone the semester before, so they'll go to Spain uh, instead of South Africa or Ghana. Really? But um, again, there are just remarkable students, especially at HBCUs, who can read through all of the, all of the misinformation that's out there and who are really just waiting for their time to make that connection, that personal connection, because mm. Right. Maybe their parents haven't been. Maybe no one in their family has or no one in their community has. So they're doing that. They're going to Africa, not just for themselves, but for everyone that they're connected to at home. They are pathfinders. Right. Absolutely. That's they're right. pathfinders. Path they're creating finders. this way. While, while, while carrying their <coughs> families, friends, communities, on their shoulders. Absolutely. Yeah. Leaders, and actually. They're leaders. Mm -hmm. They're leaders. They're leaders. Let, me ask, let me ask you this mm -hmm. question. What are some of the factors that tend to influence students' choice where 
and what to study abroad. Sure, sure. This is important because, again, we're speaking about students who are attending institutions for the purpose of getting their degree. Mm. And they don't have time to, to waste, really. They don't have the luxury of being able to take a gap semester or just travel simply for the, the desire to travel. So really what influences the choice that they make and where they go is whether or not they can receive credit mm. for the types of classes that are being offered there. Mm -hmm. And so this exactly. is something that's important for partners on the continent to, to understand. This is important for students and parents to understand that mm. um, depending on the major, certain classes can be harder to find. And right now, STEM classes are, are um, they're available, but certain accreditations may vary. STEM meaning uh, science, science and technology? Technology, mm. um, math, mm. engineering. What used to be called the hard sciences. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The hard sciences Very can be hard to find or hard to um, earn credit for. And curriculum, so on the HBCU side of things, it's important for our institutions and the faculty who teach there mm. to really value the study abroad experience, to right. value learning engineering abroad. Unfortunately, time happens not okay. to be a best ally. Kobena, what if someone suggested to you that uh, all of life is about passion, mm. action, and reaction, and that to ignore the passion, action, and reaction of your time or generation is to risk having not really lived at all, occupying space. Wow. Mm -hmm. I totally resonate with that because I'm a product of the hard sciences. I'm an electrical engineer, a system integrator within the oil and gas uh, industry. Mm. But there is a passion. Mm. to be that bridge builder, to be a connector, which has shifted me into this industry. So I totally resonate with that. People think I'm crazy for doing what I'm doing, because <laughs> leaving the oil and gas framework to come do this, yes. uh, subsist subsistent uh, without that income and the sacrifices that involve, well, right? that's so fulfilling. Unfortunately, on that note, our guests today were Malaina Montgomery, Kwabina Boateng, Joel Green win. Thanks to our audience for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better HBCU, and please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>